Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Store of the Future concept. My name is Atif Rashid. I'm a partner engineer. So I work with the Google Cloud Partner and I help build the ecosystem of capabilities. Um, I've worked in data centers for, for a very long time. I understand systems design. Uh, I like complex systems, which is really weird to say. But uh, I migrated lots of data centers, applications, like all this stuff for a really long time. And uh, my inspiration is to really bring organizations together in a meaningful way to uh, really drive some sort of value. And uh, part time, I'm also a data janitor. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So I'm Hisham Fahmi, and uh, I lead technology at Loblaw Digital. Uh, I've been building software systems for the past 20 years. Um, and a fun fact I'd like to share with you all is I used to be a fierce competitor with Google, and more specifically Nest, when I was uh, leading the engineering teams at Ecobee for seven years. But nowadays, uh, my focus is on retail and reimagining retail with Loblaw. And Google has been a fantastic partner with us along that journey. Um, so before we actually get things started, I wanted to just do a quick show of hands. Who here has had a retail experience that was driven by beacons? Has anybody had that? OK, got a couple of folks. Anybody had one that was driven by AR or VR? OK, getting smaller than numbers. Okay. <laughs> anybody try smart mirrors? OK, one person. All right, great. Um, all right, so for the people who did raise their hands, how many of you felt that those experiences actually drove you to want to buy more product in the store? OK. Nothing, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so maybe the answer to the next question is more obvious, too. How many of you felt that those experiences actually made your, your whole shopping experience way easier or a lot easier? OK, so I think you know, this kind of segues really good into where we're trying to go with this talk today. So you know, there's a lot of hype around what the store of the future is. And it always seems to be centered around what latest and greatest tech retailers are going to bring into the physical store. You know, you see all these announcements about AR and VR and beacons and location-based promotions, and the list goes on and on. But I guess the question we really have to ask ourselves is why haven't any of these taken off? You know, why aren't we seeing mass adoption of these technologies? You know, and why do we actually you know, see these announcements that go and we, you know, we receive them with a lot of excitement and fanfare, but then they tend to fizzle out after a few months and they become a fad? And so you know, maybe we're actually approaching this question from the wrong angle. And it's not necessarily that the technology is bad. In fact, the technology is really good. And a lot of these technologies are probably going to be a cornerstone, cornerstone of the store of the future. But the reality is technology on its own is not what's going to define the store of the future. It's really the fusion of technology solving a distinct and unique customer pain point that's really going to generate the stickiness that we're all, we all desire as retailers. So you know, the store of the future should really be the store that kind of can actually predict or anticipate what these customer pain points are and the customer needs, and then deliver you know, solutions that remove that friction and pain point and add elements of delight to it. So what we hope to do today in our talk is to sort of discuss some of the challenges that retailers should be thinking about, and then, and then shed, shed some light on some technology, technology bets that we think retailers should make in order to be successful in this space. So let's start by framing the problem. So you know, firstly, you know, customer needs and, and desires um, you know, and their expectations are changing faster than they ever have changed, you know, have been before. You know, and then also we have to realize that the store of the future isn't about you know, technology and innovation, but it really should be about solving that you know, and focusing on those unique customer needs. And we should also realize that the store of the future shouldn't always be just about the physical store, but we should really think about the entire customer journey. right? And so us as retailers, our job really should be is how do we amplify where and how we connect with customers? And in each of those touch points, how can we start observing and gleaning the data and these little signals that they're sending along the way that are these kind of um, indicators of what their kind of uh, uh, pain point that's coming or, or need that's emerging? And so we need to start identifying these, these trends of customer needs and then be able to sort of respond to them quickly and deploy innovations that solve them, remove the friction, and then start at layering in elements of delight and instant gratification. And so when you do this, what you do is you create this virtuous circle. You know, and if we do this well, you create a virtuous circle that actually amplifies your brand, increases your mind share, and really gets to that loyalty that we all aspire to as, as retailers. And so our hypothesis that Atifan here are here today to talk about is we believe that we need to reframe the store of the future. And it's not about the store, but it should really be about what platform do retailers build 
that enable them to deliver on the cycle and to deliver fast and continuously. So I want to share a couple examples of differing custom ne customer needs. So I'll start by a couple examples from Loblaws. So Loblaws, we actually operate in many distinct businesses. We're primarily a grocer, but we also operate in the apparel, in the beauty, and in the pharmacy business. And so for a single individual, their needs actually differ vastly across those four domains right there. And so if you start by even just the grocery shop, that's predominantly a habitual transaction. I don't know if many of you know this, but the average person only buys 260 unique grocery items a year. And so when you think about it, a customer doing a grocery shop, all they really want to do is get in as fast as they can, find those items. And in fact, what you can argue is they actually, what they really want to do is get those items in their fridges and pantries as fast as possible. And the data speaks to that, because when we look at our online grocery platform, 80% of the traffic is actually driven from item search. And, and that's the main reason why we actually added a feature called Quick Shop, which is a, a recommendation engine that tries to predict what you're most likely to want in your basket. And that actually drives 40% of our buy conversion right now. On the flip side, when you look at something like a beauty or an apparel, apparel shopping, there it's all about discovery. What customers are really looking for is inspiration. And so there, again, the data speaks to it, because we look at those sites, and only 10% of the traffic is actually driven by item search. And really, the lion's share of the traffic comes from browsing product listing pages and looking at online reviews. Another really interesting example is uh, there was a European grocer that was piloting uh, Scan and Go technology. So Scan and Go is where you can use your mobile phone and scan the grocery items as you're putting them in your, your shopping basket, and then check out and leave the store. And the belief there was that this, the adoption for that was going to be primarily young millennials, young professionals, time-starved professionals, because those are the ones that are really compressed for time. The surprise came when a large adoption, a large population of the, uh, that were adopting it were actually senior citizens. So why was that? Well, it turns out that senior citizens actually experience a lot of stress and anxiety when they're in the cashier lanes because they feel they're holding up these very long checkout lines. And it turned out that the scan and go technology actually relieved them from that stress and allowed them to do things really at their own pace. So again, these like insights that you can get. Um, you know, the last example I'll give here too is, you know, at Loblaws, we constantly do uh, NLP and sentiment analysis on the customer feedback that we get. And it overwhelmingly points to one of the major um, promoters of, of uh, a great customer experience is when, when our customers have face-to-face -face interactions with people in the store. And there's actually industry studies that actually point to that as well and are showing that how a lot of retailers are now over-indexing on creating digital experiences and digital self-serve experiences when really 73% of customers would prefer to actually deal with someone face-to-face -face when trying to solve an issue or address a problem. So it also begs the question, say, hey, should the store of the future really be about you know, deploying technology and solutions to our store colleagues to actually free up their time, relieve their stress, and give them more time to actually spend with customers? So we also have to acknowledge that you know, our customers are actually going on a journey. It's not all about that final buy transaction. Customers go through many stages of discovery, decision making, and, and along that, 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 that's their whole their journey. And so as a retailer, right, we, the key is to be able to intercept the customer at every single point along that journey. And in every one of those intercepts, to try to glean some data and some insights about what might be driving their thinking along the way and getting those little signals. And so one area of the world that is doing this really, really well is China. Um, the two dominant players there they've actually adopted a strategy where they're trying to you know, identify every single moment of consumption possible in a person's day. And then their strategy is to say, how do they capture the first minute of each one of those interactions? And so you can see it in how they're embedding their technology everywhere, as far, and they're going even as far as embedding it down into vending machines. So they're capturing the consumption even down to that level. So you know, to, to, to recap, what, what we really believe is, is that the store of the future is really this foundational platform that you can create that can intercept your customer at all points along their journey to collect all the data as much as you can and all the little signals that they're sending from you and then be able to tease out and extract you know, trends and in indicators of what might be their, their next customer pain point and then deliver on that really quickly in terms of an innovative solution that removes the friction, adds elements of delight and instant gratification and then to be able to do this continuously in a repeated cycle. Great. So to achieve this cycle that Hisham is talking about, a retailer really needs to build out some capabilities to, to get there. And we believe that cloud is, is the place to do that. Uh, 
Google Cloud's a blank slate. It's wildly flexible. You can go in, configure it, get it working exactly the way you want. The challenge with that, it also is a place where you could have a lot of complexity and a lot of sprawl, and it's intimidating. Because it's a flexible platform, um, you really want to really take a step back and focus on how customers are actually, or how you um, want to actually deliver and build these capabilities. So what I'm going to do for you now over the next few slides is share with you some experiences that I've had uh, with Loblaws and other retailers, uh, share with you the patterns and, and the software that they built to kind of get to a place where uh, you can get to that virtuous cycle of, of innovation that uh, Hisham is talking about. In the beginning, there was networking and security. And so these are two very well-established uh, organizations within uh, your retail, uh, retail outfit or retail company. Uh, from a networking perspective, uh, there's a significant uplift from an understanding on going Google Cloud. So it isn't like it is in the data center. You really need to think through the new capabilities, um, you know, how the Google Cloud works, the global load balancer, uh, the software-defined network, uh, it's radically different. So it is, you know, being a networking expert in the data center is not like being a networking expert in the cloud. Uh, security is also another area that is, you know, near and dear to Google's heart. Uh, it's built into the DNA of the data centers. But the security posture of your cloud instance is something that uh, you, as a, a consumer of cloud, needs to configure yourself. So. There's a couple ways of looking at it from, from a networking and security perspective. So you could look at it from a product perspective where I have uh, uh, something I'm trying to achieve and I'm going to take a product and I'm going to put it there. Uh, but we believe a better way to approach it is to actually look at the objective that you're trying to achieve. So the example I have here is um, say you're trying to protect yourself against anti-malware. Uh, you're trying to make sure that uh, you know, data is kept private, uh, that nothing's available to the internet. Right? Those are high-level objectives that you can think through and maybe document and then maybe back into those objectives with a technology solution. Those technolo th these technologies are innovating more and more every day. So the roadmap is coming at you fast and furious like a waterfall. And so you can really build a security posture, but then a feature or capability will come out and it'll disrupt your current architecture from like a networking and a security perspective. So staying ahead of the roadmap upstream really allows you to understand and build a security posture that I believe is more innovative, easier to manage. The other challenge is that the security and networking teams are the hardest to change in an organization. It's very hard to keep up with this stuff uh, being in the technology groups. So imagine you know, your security organization that builds policies all day and, and you know, for them, for you to explain to them how cloud works or how cloud secure is, is really hard. Um, also from a security and networking perspective, uh, we think the console, so going into the Google Cloud console is wildly flexible and easy to understand. You can go in and do a lot. But the reality is, is if you're trying to run a production application that you want to keep up and keep it high available and keep it really fast and, and work collaboratively in a group, you're really going to want to work um, on using code to actually manage your infrastructure. Because from a console perspective, you can understand the capabilities. But from an actual managing a production application, you're going to want to um, use infrastructure as code. And so at Loblaws, this was like the first step of our journey towards the Google Cloud Platform. And it was really critical for us to get this foundational piece right. Um, you know, at Loblaw, we handle our customers' PII and PHI information because we run the pharmacies. And we don't take that responsibility really lightly. And then we also are running in a hybrid cloud environment because there are still large portions of our ecosystem that still are going to be on the on-prem data center. And those are things like our inventory management systems and our ERP. And so it was really critical for us to get this right from the start and have a really good security posture and a very solid networking design. And it was one of our key principles is to have it all managed as infrastructure as code, because that was the way we could actually maintain a lot of tight control and governance over it. So once you go out and build a piece of software for how you're managing networking on cloud and another piece of software for how you're managing security, 
you now have the ability to actually use cloud in a more meaningful way. Uh, we believe the first step of the journey is to collect your data assets and understand how to analyze um, your data better. Uh, with that foundation, you can start moving, cleaning, transforming your data onto GCP in a way that will allow you to get better insights, allow your data scientists to really think through how they're analyzing uh, telemetry coming in from the store or wherever. And we believe that telemetry comes in from everywhere. So it, it could be a device, like a mobile application. It could be uh, text to speech coming into the call center uh, or customer contact center, uh, everything from video to imagery. We also think that with data that you have, you can actually now enrich it in a way that has never been possible before. So with all of our ML APIs, you now have the capability to really gain metadata in a way that's, that's special. I'm sure you've heard about a lot of uh, innovations in that regard uh, during this conference. So having now taken a couple classes in, in data science, I would say that it's a very uh, point in time endeavor, right? So you go on the Kaggle website, the data set is static. And so now with cloud, you now have the capability to start doing things real time. You have the ability to ingest data at scale, analyze it, learn from it, and maybe even action back to a customer in a way that could be all done programmatic. This cycle that you see here in, in the diagram, um, it's a cycle that's been around for a very long time. So you have the ability, like if you look back at like the way people did data warehouses you know, in t times of past, um, I would say that, that this cycle always existed, except this cycle was very large. So you would go out and build a report, do the analysis, and, and maybe months later achieve a result. And now with the systems we have today, you can do it real time. And you can build dashboards real time, and visualize things real time. This cycle really unlocks your data. So, so closing this loop really unlocks the ability to really help your customer engagement and hopefully profit and be more competitive. So to execute well on uh, customer engagement, you really need to create a safe harbor for your data. So that data needs to come in from all of your various endpoints, almost real time. And again, now with all of the really advanced streaming technologies, it's no longer just chunks of data. It's real time telemetry. This is where our network really shines, right? Because it, we're Google and we have a very, you know, a really great network story, you can now get that data faster, quicker to where you exist in a way that's, that's never happened before. We think the hardest part in this journey is building an ingestion layer that really takes your data sets from wherever they are in your organization and aggregating them to a place where you can, again, clean, move, transform that data, and standardize that data in a way that allows your data scientists to be better data scientists or for them to do better analysis. The security layer is also extended in, in this, this area, right? So it's not, security is no longer just an infrastructure play. It's, it's you know, building meaningful capabilities within how you protect, say, a non-relational database or how to you know, get to apply, uh, privacy compliant through um, cryptography. Like there's a lot of different capabilities now in this data warehouse that allows you to be more flexible than you ever could. And to try to do this in a data center is, is wildly complex and, and very hard. So at, at Loblaw, we really embraced this as a way to unlock the huge amounts of data that we had, but were scattered across so many different isolated systems in our ecosystem. So what we've done is we've actually built data pipelines now to ingest the majority of data that we have. And so when I talk about that, what we're saying is it's all our in-store transactions, all our online transactions, you know, purchase transactions, all our uh, online clickstream, 
all our store level inventory is coming in, and lastly, all our loyalty transactions. And the loyalty transactions act like the glue that connects our customers across all the channels. And so we've got pipelines, all that, ingesting it now into a big data lake in, in GCP. And as we, you know, again, continue on that journey of connecting on the different touch points along the journey, we'll continuously start, you know, keep uh, building the data pipelines into GCP for it. So yeah, I was just going to say data, data is no longer an IT function. Uh, I think it's an asset that executives, developers, and dreamers will, will use in the future. The easy part uh, is actually what comes after. So once you have now have all of your data in one place, and uh, I believe now is where you really start getting the best sort of bang for your buck. And with sort of how you analyze data, and if you start using these new, sophisticated, really fast, auto-scalable tools, um, you can now report better, you can uh, learn from your data, you can enrich your data in scale, you can enrich it real time. And the one thing that I would say is that a data scientist is a very multidisciplinary thing. I think an effective data scientist for retail is 50% a retailer, 25% a statistician, and maybe 25% a coder. It, it's hard. It really is. Like, to get someone who's very non-technical, uh, maybe like a mathematician, to pick up the latest tools, to actually understand machine learning, to actually solve a business problem at a retailer, it's a very difficult thing to do. And we believe that if that person or that data scientist really wants to achieve something meaningful, you really need to abstract away uh, managing of clusters or dealing with infrastructure or scale or compute cycles. Like That really just has to be removed from the equation. Focusing on solving real world problems is, is the key to success for a retailer. Uh, we think that it's less about building a system and more about, again, the customer engagement. The other thing is the real value that comes from this is the integration across the platform. So once you get the data into GCP, the integrations are plentiful, and you can replatform, change, you know, visualize ETL jobs. There's a lot you can do, and you can aggregate all of that stuff up to like a real-time dashboard. And so. Uh, I was actually at a, a tech startup uh, the other day, and I remember seeing uh, in their reception area every single person that's touching or working with their application or their brand. And it was real time. It was actually like I could see the numbers moving, right? And that, that's where I think uh, retailers need to get to. And so just to illustrate some of the power that you have you know, for the techniques that Atta is mentioning and having that data, um, at Loblaw, we had a really interesting problem we had to solve in our online grocery business, and that's called you know, fill rate. And so if you look at the click and collect grocery model, a customer places their order online but goes to their local store to pick it up. And so what ends up happening is our stores are acting like mini fulfillment centers uh, to, to fulfill the orders. And so what that also means is that we're actually competing for inventory with the actual foot traffic going in the store. So now the challenge becomes, how do I guarantee for a person who's putting an online order right now that's going to be picked up in a couple hours, that whatever they've actually asked for is going to be physically on the shelf when they come to pick it up? Because if it's not, there's a lot of disappointment that happens there. And so using all the data that we have and a lot of machine learning models, we were actually able to develop some really accurate models that could forecast what would be the shelf availability at the time when the order is going to be prepared. And then using that data, we can actually now dynamically change the assortment that's showing online at any given time. So we can keep that fill rate high and in the high 90s. So switching gears, now that you've wrangled your data together, now that you're analyzing it, now that your executives are happy and your developers can actually do something, you've now gleaned some insights into what it is to be a retailer. So now you understand that, hey, I found some challenges. I need to do something about it. We believe the way to take action, or we know the way to take action, is by building a really smart application to address those points of friction or those pain points. Historically, application development cycle times have been very long. So if you had a monolithic app from 10 years ago and you wanted to actually go out and 
and deliver something. You would throw your code over a fence, and then maybe six months later, it might see the internet light of day. That, those days are gone, right? Now you can do that release cycle almost instantly or within minutes. And so we believe, um, they, and, and for those of you who, who've seen this before, uh, this is a CI-CD pipeline. And a CI-CD pipeline is uh, wildly, like a really good way to take the siloed organization that's working any which way and kind of, again, wrangling it through a pipeline to actually achieve a result. And while it requires some upfront you know, investment and thinking through how I'm going to build applications, I think down the line, you've solved so many more meaningful problems in how you ship code. So uh, we're going to walk through a bit of that today. Developers just want to run code, right? Again, just like the data scientists, a developer just wants to take what they have, run it, and maybe move on to the next piece of, of challenging code they need to build. Um, but operations, they care about r reducing risk. They don't want the application to go down. They want to make sure the business users are happy. And that's, how, that's where they focus. So we believe that developers should just be developers. Operations should just be operations. A CI CD pipeline is flexible enough that both of those organizations can exist in any which way. And you can build your pipeline to actually work the way they work now, but also work way, uh, the way they're going to work in the future. You should really meet your um, customers where they are, right? So as you optimize this thinking, you know, it's different than it was in the data center. In the data center, you had a rigid environment. You had to figure out how to make things run. And, and to re-architect could be something that took months. And those days are gone. Because these days, it is architect, iterate, architect, iterate, architect, iterate. That's it. And so you can go as far and as fast to get as perfect as possible an application in a way that you never could before. We also believe that uh, the developer experience is at the heart of keeping uh, talented uh, individuals working on interesting problems. Um, so this diagram, again, is a typical CI CD pipeline. There's a few sort of attributes to keeping a CI CD pipeline um, slick, in my opinion. And uh, you want to keep your pipelines fast, so you don't want your build or your movement through the pipeline to take forever. Um, you want to isolate environments, so you may want to make sure that as you're shipping your code from environment to environment, that the de developer environment never touches production. You, know, you want to make sure that the pipeline is the only way people can access production. You don't want uh, people changing production environments through a console. Um, I'm not sure if anyone heard about the release of, of Cloud Builder. Anyone heard about this? It's, uh, it seems pretty amazing, right? It's an entire CI CD managed pipeline offering coming out of Google Cloud. It just was released this week. Um, historically, people had to build you know, their own CI CD environment, their own pipelines. Now we have like a managed tool, which is completely abstracted uh, out. Um, there's a lot of administration and engineering that kind of goes into creating a CI CD pipeline. Um, but we, again, think that this upfront investment uh, is worthwhile because it will definitely allow you to iterate faster to get closer to a better customer experience. So speaking about Cloud Builder, my Slack messenger was going like crazy a couple <laughs> hours ago with all my DevOps team saying, did you hear the announcement? Did you hear the announcement? When are we going to start using it? So, oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, at LawBuzz, we really took advantage of these uh, ephemeral environments that you have on GCP. Um, and what it's allowed us to do is really get to, a close, get to a point where we have a CI CD pipeline that is getting us very close to zero downtime deployments. And you know, we're able to do this even though a large part of our platform is actually a legacy monolith application. It's a monolithic application. So that's quite phenomenal that we're able to do this. And you know, we've managed actually also to eliminate a lot of these interim test environments they have you know, between your SIT and your UAT and pre-prod. And, and then all the pains that come with none of those environments never even match what you have in production. And so kind of we've blown all that away. And we really only have one blueprint. right? And then that's what our CI CD pipeline publishes to. And we test against it. And when it's all good, we publish as is and promote it to production. And now we can almost do this in under an hour. 
And so this is really given us, or starting to give us the, f the speed and flexibility and agility that we need to really deliver on that virtuous cycle of the store of the future. Yeah. So I'm from Canada. Um, the talent pool in Canada is, is really, really hard, <laughs> you know, small. The, it's, I, I would say the smallest Google office you've ever seen, like comparatively speaking, right? And training people is hard, right? You know, once you train them, they kind of go through the motions, and then, you know, yeah, you're at risk, they might leave. And uh, yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to retain talent, it really is. And so, especially in a new platform or a new technology, um, it, it's just hard. And so, skills development is something that's very near and dear to my heart. I, as a person who plays with technology, I always have to figure out you know, it's like one of those choose your own adventure novels. I don't know if you had those when you were a kid, where you're like, oh shoot, I turn the page and then, you know, it's the end of the story, right? I actually constantly have to figure out what investment of time I'm going to make to learn something new and, and try to align it with, oh wait, that's where the future's going, right? And it's humbling, it really is. And so, so we believe that partnerships are essential to really kind of getting somewhere on a cloud journey. Uh, it's, just, it's just true. Uh, we have, uh, because of like, the nature of the platform, so Google Cloud's like wildly multi-tenant. You can have uh, you know, an, any number of people accessing your environment, doing something. There's granular controls and permissions to make sure they're not doing what they're not supposed to, right? Um, you can slice up that security and responsibility in a way that you can actually build these pieces of software independent of each other if you need to, right? So you can actually prevent you know, um, your data scientists from touching the networking stack, right? And because you're managing all of this with code and there's version control and how all of this stuff is evolving, that's key to um, you know, keeping everything kind of working. And we believe that these components are pretty key to, to you being, like, or anyone being successful in getting you know, their applications, especially from an enterprise. Um, you know, historically, if you were a large retailer, you would have like, outsourcing arrangements, like these large multi-year outsourcing arrangements uh, that were large and complex. But these days, you can accomplish a lot with a very small, agile team. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing, right? Because you, again, you're, you're iterating really fast and you're innovating really fast. So you don't, you don't really need as many, uh, you know, people as you traditionally did. Um, partners historically have provided services like staff augmentation. So they're like, here, here's a, here's a body and they're going to sit in your team and they're going to do a bunch of stuff. Uh, or maybe they provide training, but we actually see it's like a new age of partner that exists now. And those partners have things like software, a managed service, plus, plus professional services, plus value-added services, and they're orchestrating them in a way that is repeatable across different companies, especially industries. So if you're trying to build like a security uh, layer on GCP, well, don't reinvent the wheel, right? There's, people, there's partners out there who have done it. And so, you know, we, we actually recently published with Google a case study on our journey to the, to the cloud. And we actually, you know, it highlighted how we actually leveraged some partners to help us get there. Um, and in fact, some of the partners are here in the room, and so thank you to them. Um, and so, you know, I encourage you guys to all to read it. It's there on the uh, Google Cloud customer site. Um, but it really talks about how you can really lean into the partners and really augment the areas of skill where you don't have that, you know, today in your, in your own shop. So now that you have you know, a networking and security and you've built a CI CD pipeline and a data warehouse and a data analysis, now you get to the good stuff, right? Now you're really building innovation. You really want to do something more. And now you can think more um, like a creative lab and less like a data center, right? So now you're taking capabilities, you're understanding them, you're orchestrating them in a way uh, that is like, meaningful to your end customers. Uh, so I, you know, I'm not sure if you guys have heard about AutoML or the Vision API, right? Um, you know, I've seen, um, you know, uh, I, I was at a retailer and they had like a very large, you know, th like looking thing that looked like a conveyor belt, and 
you know, you had to take a bunch of images, and as objects move through the image, it's just a big thing, and it's a big investment. And now with AutoML, you can do it with an API in a mobile app, right? You can train the Vision API with your own data or your own product catalog, and now, you know, sort of achieve the same result for, you know, a very, very easy uplift, right? And so I've seen another uh, cool technology, Indoor Street View, which is, uh, you know, I, I talked to their team, you know, once upon a time. Again, it's a very uh, a Google focused area, like it's like a more on the research and development. But you can take the indoor mapping of a, of a room in minutes, right? It's wildly fast. And it is really granular. It uh, kind of has a high resolution photo, and you can like exist in this 3D representation of a space. And you'll just see more and more of those innovations kind of coming out in a way that'll kind of get closer and closer to that to your enterprise. Um, so there's three main buckets at, at Google, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, there's Google Cloud, which is, you know everyone's here for, for next to, to learn about Google Cloud. But we also think that the second bucket is the cloud roadmap. And I, I know I mentioned this earlier, but you really want to work with your customer teams to actually understand what's coming down from a roadmap perspective, from a capability perspective. Because there's something, something really special might just be around the corner. And if you can like, embrace it, work through it, and innovate on it in a meaningful way, like, that's, that's a real differentiator for you as a, as a retailer. Uh, oh, yeah, and then there's the, the research and development bucket. Right? So that's all the cool stuff that you hear about in the news. And uh, you know, they, it's, it's definitely an awesome area of Google, right? And, and figuring out how they're thinking through like, the world's problems or the world's information is, 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 is so interesting to me. And I think where a retailer could really you know, kind of innovate from a customer experience perspective is actually string together solutions from all three areas. Like really try to understand the ecosystem across the board and string together something meaningful. And, and maybe back into that from the objective of, uh, I want to solve a customer problem. Um, so again, back to the customer experience. You, you, know, you want to get context as to who they are, what they're doing, right? Um, the telemetry of the journey that they go through with your brand. And you want to incorporate these great technologies uh, in a way, again, that sets you apart. Um, sorry. No. So, uh, so just an example of how this stack actually unlocks innovation for us. We recently had a problem we really had to solve, again, in our online grocery business. And it was about the pickup time. And where we wanted to make sure that the pickup time across all our store network was always under five minutes. And so the pickup time is defined from when a person shows up in their car to the store to the time when the groceries are actually loaded in the trunk. And what we were finding is that experience wasn't consistently under five minutes across our whole store network, but keeping it under five minutes was a, a key driver to customer satisfaction and a good experience. And so to tackle this, what we did is we formed a small outcome team of only six people. And it really had a couple of store operations folks, it had a couple of process engineers, and only two developers. And they basically said they're going to tackle this problem. And as part of the solution that they came up with, they needed to build a mobile app and an in-store dashboard that would sort of trigger when a customer you know, had certain events that trigger when a customer showed up, and then started triggering various process events occurring. And so the two developers, you know, using uh, Firebase and Firestore, were able to actually spin a prototype in under two weeks and start testing right away live in the stores. And then about three months later, we got to a point where we actually are ready now to launch this across our whole entire the uh, nationwide store network, and actually offer a guarantee to customers that your groceries are free if they're not delivered in under five minutes. So just shows you all like, you know, the innovation that you can really unlock. There are so many retail technologies out there. Uh, it's really hard to keep up. Uh, I think the secret is to not necessarily celebrate the wow factor of it, but really back into it from, um, you know, again, the customer's perspective or customer lens. We have seen things like augmented or virtual reality, voice to chatbot and home, you know, you can gamify experiences, right? Make it super interesting. You spend so much effort trying to make that work. Uh, but the reality is it might not solve the ch challenge of your customer, right? It might not actually help them. And so taking a step back and really thinking through the experience, you know, kind of requires less of a technical mind and more of a creative mind. 
And the next generation, uh, I think, of, of creative thinkers in this space for retailers are going to come from a new age or a new generation of user experience designers who are going to be able, who are going to be technical, who are going to be multidisciplinary, and understand how to orchestrate those capabilities for a customer, for someone. And I think that is going to be uh, like a really interesting area of the future. I saw this uh, one cool API. Uh, so again, I, I look at APIs a lot. And um, you know, the, uh, it, it does, it's called the Awareness API. And uh, you know, I didn't get a good, good sense of it. But I know it does uh, like a virtual fence. So it can like, understand you know, once you've moved beyond a certain point. And, and you know, so you can now do like, context switching of the space. And it does things like, you know, the, like the headset, like if I remove a headset from my device, now I have a different experience in my mobile app. I just thought it was, it was super interesting. Um, I also think ultimately you want to delight your customers and reduce the friction, um, you know, and, and make it less, again, about the technology and more about helping your, your customers. We believe the physical store is also the last frontier. Um, you know, today with cameras and a flexible store format, you can receive telemetry very much like a website and use that click it's, it's almost like clickstream data coming from a website and imagine a store experience where you the markdown of prices were programmatic uh, you never miss a sale or worry about coupons right it could all be digital um, you know what if you get loyalty points just by showing up right uh, how much more interesting would a window display be if it could react to your presence in a meaningful way Right? The store experience is going to be less about moving product and more about brand. It's going to be more about your brand experience. Um, has anyone here taken part in an escape room? Uh, we have them in Canada. I'm not sure. Yeah, you, they have them? OK. So I could tell you exactly which escape rooms I've been in. Right? I could tell you the friends that were with me that went through the journey. Like The escape rooms are cool. They, like, we move through and solve puzzles and then eventually escape. I cannot tell you about the last five department stores I've been at. Right? I don't remember, because it, was, it, was it wasn't there for me. And so I think there's going to be a real change in how people interact with brands. And I think it's going to be the constant reinvention of the physical store, along with the online store, um, you know, that's going to get you to a place where that brand affinity will be at its best. So. You know, again, I bought uh, an Android Wear watch, which I'm not wearing right now, which I swore I was going to wear. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a typical geek, and I watch, like, unboxing videos and stuff like that. And so, you know, I just remember going through an ocean of stuff to, like, figure out which watch was the right, right one for me. Um, you know, I went to the manufacturer's website, and I signed up. I put in, like, my email and everything, and then they actually emailed me. And they're like, hey, is, is, can I send you more information, right? And I'm like, no, I can search for what I need, right? Like, I don't need more information from you. And so um, in the end, I ended up buying from a, a manufacturer or, or watch manufacturer that uh, gave me a promo code, right? But because it came from a manufacturer, not a retailer, it took me forever to get it. It was like three weeks, right? I really think all of that could have been improved by technology, right? My research could have been aggregated, you know? Um, it could have been easier. It could have been frictionless. I think the back end for this stuff is really easy, being like a systems guy who's like looking at these problems, right? I think about them all the time. You know, here's some examples. I love museums and national parks. What if I could gamify a mobile experience where I could learn more about what I'm doing? I went to Cape Town, or sorry, South Africa, Kruger National Park. You know, I'm just like, we're trying to find the buffalo in our Jeep, right? Why couldn't that be a mobile app? Young families in a mall, right? How do you make a mall safer? for your family, right? How do you make it so it's less of a, a shopping experience and more of a community center? Um, you know, I had this, like, this idea, like, I go to concerts, right? So I like concerts, and, you know, what if uh, everyone has their phones up taking video, right? So what if you could actually manipulate flashlights and have a light show that could be part of the light show, right? All that stuff is possible, right? Rethinking that stuff is very possible today, more so than it's ever been. And so we believe the retail experience will kind of uh, enhance that. Um, the store of the future is not an end state. Uh, it's a continuous journey. You know, you want to connect closely with your customers. Uh, you want to bring all the best data to bear. You want to build applications fast. And 
it's going to be a blank canvas uh, for creative thinkers, technologists, and programmers and brand strategists to come together and think differently. Um, we believe it's more possible than ever on, on Google Cloud. And uh, you know, we think uh, you can keep your customers happy. And truly, your customers uh, would be delighted if you laid, made their lives easier. Thank you. Thank you.